Got almost 7 million Ukrainians, mostly women and children. And the vast majority of these, they uh, left Ukraine. They came abroad. We have to show them in every way that Ukraine is remembering about them. But we take care of them. We have a sad statistics when it comes to Ukraine, but only 35% of Ukrainian citizens out of all the respondents, they actually plan to return home. Hello and welcome to Ukraine in Flames, a special project by Ukraine Media Center, an NGO Euro-Atlantic course. And I'm your host, Maroslava Yarenkiv. Millions of Ukrainians went abroad as refugees. And already within 16 months of the war, some of them adapted to the European rhythm and standard of living. Surveys show that a significant number of such Ukrainians do not plan to return to Ukraine. They are gradually adapting to new conditions, but a long-term stay in between countries when part of the family remains in Ukraine and the other is scattered around the world has become a really difficult test. In this regard, a dilemma arose for a lot of them. What to do next? To return home or to start building a life in a new place with long-term home and a permanent job? In today's episode, we're going to talk about Ukrainian refugees in the EU countries and how, when, and under what conditions will they return home. If you want to learn more about this subject, please continue watching this video and subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss our videos in the future. Still, a lot of Ukrainians live in abroad plan to return to Ukraine. And those who are no longer considering such an opportunity for themselves obviously have valid reasons for this. Perhaps someone simply doesn't have a home anymore because it was destroyed by Russian bombs and missiles. And someone found a well-paid job and supports Ukraine with currency transfers, which according to the National Bank, reach several billion dollars every year. Despite this, Ukraine is certainly extremely interested in the return of its citizens, because without this it will be not possible to quickly rebuild the country after the victory and move on to sustainable economic growth. Co-founder of the National Platform for Resilience and Social Cohesion, Yulia Tyshenko, doesn't want to use the word refugees when speaking about Ukrainians abroad, only seekers of temporary protection, as she believes that a lot of them will return home after all. Please take a listen. Since the full-scale invasion started, according to various calculations, we have like various figures given different statistics, but almost 7 million Ukrainians, mostly women and children. And the vast majority of these, they uh, left Ukraine. They came abroad. And at a different moment, they stayed uh, in new states. Mostly new states. Uh, we have various figures given, and I think that no exact number of those prolonging this temporary protection status, extending it in total in EU countries, we still don't have that figure, but more than 3 million, 3.5 million, let's say. At least this, this is the figure that's given by uh, international organizations. So... Uh, this mass uh, movement of people, mass migration, and uh, we are so grateful to EU for, of course, uh, this temporary protection directive. It's not about, it's, it's, these are not refugees, not labor migration. This is a very unique tool that uh, was aimed to provide those who are fleeing, saving their lives, saving themselves from the war. Give a chance to stay legally in the country, EU countries, be protected, get some basic uh, social package, let's say. Yeah, Let, let's call it social package. In different countries, it looks in a different way. And uh, have a right to be employed. So every country, based on its legislation, its vision, its capacity, was... Uh, Establishing implementation mechanism for this directive, EU directive on temporary protection. And in different countries, uh, what we do observe various policies and various consequences for our citizens, mostly women again, uh, on those issues. I really don't want to use the word refugees, please. Conflicts with refugees in EU countries... With refugees from other states, yes, it exists. In different countries, we have different social groups, strata, where 
Ukrainians may have tense interaction. Uh, Arabic states, refugees, and Ukrainians. This is like the competition for social resource. Conflicts in terms of Russian narrative affecting societies of different countries. I mean, the EU member states in particular. Somewhere this is really targeted. Why? Because uh, if your price for energy goes up, yeah, uh, because of the war of Ukraine in Ukraine and uh, social welfare for Ukrainians, it's like it's it's disseminating massively in Facebook groups. I'm not even mentioning media. Uh, disseminating these messages. It's it's a challenge, not even for Ukrainians, but it's a test for European unity. Those who are providing support to Ukraine. And it's clear that there is a social competition and so on. Yeah, we heard language, language. Uh, I may be mistaken. I think within a year to master a language of maybe in Czech Republic, it's easier because it's pretty s similar, but Sweden, yeah? Uh, the B2 level or C1, when you have kids and social problems, I think getting that level, yes, we may have, we have positive cases and success stories, but this is a big, big, big challenge reaching that level. It's, it's about long-term strategies, of course. The more Ukrainians return, the faster the economy will grow. It would also contribute to security in Europe and mean that the EU will need to spend less on rebuilding Ukraine. Head of Migration Studies Department at Institute for Demography and Social Studies Oleksiy Pozniak will elaborate on ways to motivate Ukrainians to come back. Oh yes, truly these uh, events that we had happening last year, these led to unprecedented, uh, since the World War Second Times, unprecedented migration flows. Ukraine is one of the biggest in demographic dimension, one of the biggest countries in the world. <sighs> Sorry, in, in, in Europe. And um, even if we relocate a small share of Ukrainian population, it's a huge amount of people. We can't compare it with what happened... Uh, like, we can't compare it with former Yugoslavia process, you know? So, quite often, when we talk about the numbers, you know, the, the scope of relocation, we give, they give figures, uh, the state border guard service gives us, but these data, these um, are not data about people, but border crossing data. So the same person can do it multiple times, you know, cross the border, move abroad and return like some minor movements that we have. Uh... So within the first uh, months of war, it decreased, but since summer 2022, again, it reactivated all these movements, I mean, with border crossing. You know that when we had this uh, duty-free vehicle uh, transportation, for example, women or uh, men age 60 plus were moving abroad to take those vehicles there, you know, and just driving those vehicles across the border. So these people are just transporting the cars for certain needs. And also women's temporary visits they pay to their men. Uh, it all affects basically the statistics when we take this border crossing uh, statistics in particular. What it actually tells us uh, that this new phenomenon is really hard to be analyzed correctly. So uh, how can we bring our people back? Well, first of all, we have to uh start creating the policy today it must be focused first of all in post-war period because right now we can't call our people back we can't call those back you know those who are staying in safe conditions which we, we just can't do it because we still have the missile shelling some of them um uh, were running away from uh temporarily occupied territories or like uh 
areas close to hostilities, so it's not it's not it's not a case. What is the most important thing today? Mm, strengthening connections with Ukrainians staying abroad. We have to show them in every way that Ukraine is remembering about them, that we take care of them. They must feel that Ukraine needs them, you know? They have to get this feeling. We in the chat, there was uh, a message on secondary education that some countries demand uh, for kids to go to their schools, but we have to stimulate people for at least such uh, subjects as Ukrainian language and history, those they can't actually... Um, that those are missing in the curricula. Foreign schools, at least, you know, somehow to handle that remotely. Also, of huge importance is the electoral problem. We spoke of that when we studied labor migration before the full-scale invasion, that ensuring the opportunity to take part in election, uh, it's one of the key elements which would tie uh, our migrants to Ukraine. Formally, there is a right to take part in elections. Nobody can say that it doesn't exist. But in fact, you have to move to another part of the country just uh, to go to a uh, diplomatic mission, register, go and vote. And like many people feel that this is like a big challenge and obstruction. So... We have to use the global experience and we have to implement for certain categories of migrants the uh, remote voting mechanisms. We somehow have to use it, you know, by mail maybe. Um, after the war is over, the opportunity... Well, people will return depending on the situation in Ukraine. If we manage to involve it to attract investment... We had these meetings on post-war recovery in Ukraine, the international events, and many countries um, decided to um, be responsible for recovery of specific regions. If everything goes well, Ukraine may be very attractive, not just for our citizens who left, but also for even residents of our countries and citizens of other countries. Circumstances are changing very quickly, and the mood of Ukrainians is changing as well. For example, some experts expected that half million to one million Ukrainians could leave due to the shelling of the infrastructure and the blackouts. But this did not happen. Director of the Department for the Protection of the Rights of Citizens Affected by Armed Aggression Irina Kalupaka believes that a solution to Ukrainian forced migration cannot be solved without intervention of Ukrainian state bodies. Let's hear what she has to say. Due to the war against Ukraine, almost 13 million people uh, had to flee, had to run away. And I do hope that... And they... they fled because they wanted to save their lives. These are the official UN data that we use in our activity. Uh, apart from it, uh, there's also a fact that approximately 22 million people crossed the border with Ukraine in 2022, since uh, February 21st, 2022. And we also know that um, more than 19 million people came to the EU states Temporary protection was given to 5 million Ukrainians and over 8 million Ukrainian citizens were regist are registered as refugees in the United States. Uh, also, we realized that at the very beginning when uh, Ukrainians uh, just moved to the friendly countries, there was an issue, of course, of humanitarian aid to be provided. Currently, talking to these people, meeting these uh, visiting these countries and talking to them there directly. We understand right now. Uh, legal issues are important for them. Legal procedures, how to find accommodation, not temporary, but um, permanent. Uh, then also employment, documents. 
medical services and everything else. We have to understand uh, that there can be no successful solution for this without intervention of Ukrainian party, Ukrainian state bodies. Uh, we speak of the pension expenses to be recalculated and uh, disability, uh, disability f a type to be verified and social welfare as well. Yeah, every, all that I mentioned. A lot was spoken about the gratitude of Ukrainians to friendly countries for their hospitality and support. Yes, we have a sad statistics when it comes to Ukraine, but only 35% of Ukrainian citizens out of all the respondents, they actually plan to return home. And every third Ukrainian staying in EU countries right now only each third Ukrainian wants to return to homeland. This is true, but we understand that we have less positive cases. Uh, we should talk about it as well, because um, we have representatives of other states as well. We all are well informed on certain situations, well known. The Czech Republic, you remember what we had with the Ukrainian girl? Uh, when um, she was uh, discriminated because she spoke of her Ukrainian origin and um, similar situations we had in Germany, in Poland as well. So uh, we respond to each that case. We ask you, uh, the EU state governments, please, uh, Raise the awareness and respond to this as well. We're grateful to all the countries accepting our citizens and providing the support. The attitude towards refugees from Ukraine is worsening in European countries. Such a thesis is constantly spread by pro-Russian channel. They also try to persuade that the amount of support Ukrainians receive will also decrease significantly. Three or four months and the situation will become even worse for Ukrainians. Oleg Hovoychik, activist helping Ukrainians in the Czech Republic, will elaborate more on that. First of all, I'll comment the figures that attitude is worsening to Ukrainians in Czech Republic in particular. I'd like to comment upon that. Uh, yes, we have to... Uh, Recognize, yes, it's worsening within the last months, but uh, approximately 60% of Czechs in total are supporting Ukraine's ready to do it in future. So no, it's not that dark and uh, pessimistic. Of course, we have certain... Uh, the thing with the competition the labor market, it's there, yeah. I'll bring back to it. I'll come back to it. But uh, how do I see the situation? The key reasons for this attitude worsening, it wasn't about the actions of Ukrainians taken by Ukrainians, but more the worsening of the general economic condition, energy crisis, inflation, and so on. And these things are um, used by certain politicians, uh, by populists, and it somehow affects the public opinion, of course. What can we do with that? First of all, of course, uh, awareness raising, providing information. It was already mentioned, I just want to stress on that again, that Ukraine has to enhance information, support, and connection with the state uh ukrainians have to uh enhance these connections with the state and telling about some good stuff happening in a in a specific host state so what great things are done by ukrainians there yes we have highly qualified professionals who positively affect ukraine's image here in czech republic because business feels the need uh, to hire qualified staff, and we have these constant discussions. 
Maybe it's another stakeholder. It would be good to communicate with them and um, have more tight interaction because business have their interests, of course, relevant interests. And uh, if we go back to information issue, uh, Czech Republic, unlike other countries, has a big, powerful Ukrainian diaspora, people who moved Czech Republic before the war, much uh, just like me, you know, many, many years ago. Since February 2022, we've been supporting Ukraine a lot and armed forces, but doing it in such a way, you know, specific, typical for Ukraine. Volunteering, personal initiatives, it's more of a networking approach. Of course, it gives result. But uh, it would be really good to have some more systemic decisions. So in informational uh, aspect, it would be really good at the level of state, at the level of media, to think uh, of the narratives uh, we really want to bring to people, not just Ukrainians staying in Czech Republic, to Czechs, you know? Simultaneously and channels, which communication channels, with which groups do we have to communicate? Do we do we want to communicate? You've been watching a special project by Ukraine Media Center, an NGO Euro-Atlantic course dedicated to the Russian-Ukrainian war, Ukraine in flames. In the description under this video, you can find information on how you can help Ukraine fight Russian aggression. If you find our work useful, please like and share this video. Slava Ukraini!